is going to be Johnny Boshiko, who is a multidisciplinary software engineer with a love for teaching and community building. Now, uh, I should tell you that this is going to be a somewhat special talk in that the talk section of it, the first 30 minutes, is going to be a recording. But Johnny will be joining us afterwards for Q&A, so make sure to uh, put your questions into the Q&A tab, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to them live afterwards. Uh, have fun. You are no doubt at least aware of Go's famed concurrency capabilities. While it is true that features like GoRoutines can help you make quick work of certain tasks, this power can actually be a source of problems in your code if allowed to run unrestrained. I'm Johnny Borsico. Over the next few minutes, we'll walk through an exercise to illustrate both the dangers and the elegance of Go concurrency. We'll do that by building a port scanner together. We'll start with the simplest thing that could work and layer on some sophistication as we go. Excited? Me too. Before we jump into code though, let's get a shared understanding of port scanning. TCP-based communication between two network devices first requires a handshake process to succeed before data can be exchanged on a given port. Here's what that looks like. A client sends a synchronized packet to a server to start the process. If willing to communicate over the port in question, the server sends back an acknowledgement of the synchronized packet. Once the client acknowledges the server's acknowledgement, data can now flow easily between it and the server. If the server is not willing to engage with the client, which can be the case if there is no process listening on a port in question, it responds with a reset packet. There are other circumstances under which a server may not respond at all, but we won't need to explore those for this exercise. Port scanning, then, is simply a process of enumerating the number of open ports on a host by attempting to successfully establish a handshake with that host port by port. The Go Center library comes with a powerful set of packages that allow us to build these kinds of networked applications and much more. For our needs, we'll rely on the net packages dial function to abstract away all of those low level details with regards to uh, sending and receiving packets and interpreting them, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll rely on that library to do the heavy lifting for us. Now that we know what we're building and what tools the center library makes available to build it with, let's iterate through some code. The first version of our program is really about the simplest thing that could possibly work. So we know we're going to leverage the net packages dial function. So on line 11, that's what we're doing. On, uh, let's talk about the results that are coming back from uh, this uh, function call. So here's a documentation for that particular pack, uh, package and, and function call. The signature requires that we send in a uh, network. It can be uh, of uh, TCP or UDP or variants thereof. And uh, we're going to need an address. This is going to be a combination of the host, the host address, and the port. What port are we trying to connect over? Remember, we do need that port information in order to actually scan ports, right? Uh, the That information is uh, separated by a colon. So we have host, colon, and port, OK? Now, let's bring that up again. Let's make note of uh, the results, the types of uh, the results that are coming back. Uh, the first value is of type net con. We're not going to do a lot with uh, with the, this uh, value. Um, but we, what we care about is really the error value and uh, checking it to ensure that um, basically that's going to be our signal to know whether uh, we're able to successfully establish a connection uh, to the host on that particular port or not. Now, again, remember, we don't really care why uh, a failure happens. It, it could be because we can't uh, reach that port. There's nothing running on, on that uh, on that host at that port. Or it could be there's some, some other thing at the network edge or firewall or whatever the case may be that prevents us from making that connection. Either way, as long as we get an error back, we are going to consider that port closed. And that's exactly what we're doing here on line 13, basically doing an error check to say, hey, if for whatever reason I get an error back, I'm going to consider that port closed for all intent purposes. And then as we move on, once we get past that uh, conditional, we know that uh, the port is open. And here we're just closing it before we uh, actually print out that then we found an open port. All right. So let's actually run this program. Let me bring up the terminal. And um, let me do a go run main. 
Okay, and uh, this is the first pass, and indeed port 5000 is closed. So they bring back the code again. So we hard coded port 5000. Our program is gonna get a bit more sophisticated as we go. But 5000, we know that that the first port that we're checking and that it is closed. Now I happen to know that I have a Postgres server running locally on port 5432. So if I were to change this to reflect that port, and let's go back to the terminal. Let me run this program again. Ha! Huh, we see something a little different. Now we know that our program is able to interrogate the, the, the port, attempt to make a connection um, on the host at that particular port, and know when there is something um, bound to that port on the host. Okay. Now that we've got really sort of the, the core, the, the basics of the port scanner, um, we need to be able to scan more than just one port, right? We need to make the, this program a bit more useful, so, and we need to be able to scan a range of ports. Now let's get into the, uh, uh, let's evolve this program to uh, see if we can scan a range of ports. All right, so here in this version of the program, we're really uh, scanning, we're just in a for loop, we're really scanning a, a couple hundred um, ports uh, with the, using this for loop here. Again, the, the core logic of the program hasn't really changed at all. We're still using net.dal and interrogating the, the, the response to make sure that uh, we didn't get an error. And if we did, um, we consider that port to be closed and we move, we move on to the next port uh, in, in, a, in, in our for loop. Uh, again, same basic, um, same basic uh, project here. Let's uh, pull up the terminal and get into the appropriate folder and let's do a go run main and here we are we are scanning and we've scanned a couple hundred ports um, and uh, if we were to scroll down and there we go we have found the one open port within that list within that range that is open all right so far so good so now the the way we sort of uh, to, to make this program more useful if you were to look at this and say and start to wonder well is there really a dependency between scanning port 5300 and say port 5400 or port 5301 for that matter right there is really no dependency between those things this is what you would call an embarrassingly parallel kind of problem right there is no dependency from one scan to the next this makes it a good candidate for concurrency Okay, so this is the next version of our program where we introduce concurrency using the Go keyword. So what we're going to do here is it basically it still iterate through our same list of ports, and what we're going to do is launch a Go routine with uh, the core logic that we're using to check the ports, and we're just going to launch a Go routine to actually perform that work in a separate thread of execution. Okay, and then uh, we're going to do that for all uh, a couple hundred ports, uh, uh, 300 ports also that uh, we're going to scan. Okay, let's actually run this program and and see what we get. Hmm. Okay, so what's happening here is that the main Go routine, right, is not waiting for these uh, uh, Go routines that we're actually launching to perform the scan. Once it actually launches these Go routines, it just moves on onto the next step, which you know is printing out uh, whatever's on line 21. So what we need is a mechanism to actually force our main Go routine to wait on those uh, Go routines that have been launched. So we're going to introduce the sync package now to synchronize this main Go routine and these uh, other threads of executions that we're launching. In this version of the program, we've parameterized the host, uh, the starting port and ending port uh, for our scan operation, and ensured that when you invoke the program with these things, that the values that you're sending in actually make sense, that you're sending in numbers and not letters, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, actually making sure that uh, the uh, the from the range, the port range you're providing actually does make sense as well. The thing that's got interesting is starting on line 39. This is where we actually make use of the sync package's weight group type. The way the weight group works is that you you can uh, tell it the number of uh, Go routines to wait on, and uh, as those Go routines finish doing their work, they will call a done method on that weight group, thereby decrementing the uh, the counter uh, that the weight group uses by one. So, in other words, the we know ahead of time how many Go routines we are going to launch to do the scan work, right? So, because we're going to get the two port and front port, so we can calculate ahead of time how many Go routines we need to wait on. Hence, this uh, very verbose um, variable name here. So we use the add to set that, that uh, um, value uh, for our weight group. And then inside of those go routines, 
routines, as uh, each one gets done, it will call the done method on this wait group, thereby decrementing by one. So here on line 54, this is where we're actually telling the main routine, right, to actually wait on these other routines that we've launched um, to not move on until the, uh, the counter has reached zero and this operation stops blocking at that point. So I'm going to invoke the program. And the default port uh, has kicked in. So the, the front port is uh, by default 8080 and the two port is by default 8090. And that's what's kicked in here. But already we're, we can already see an improvement from the previous iteration of the program, right? Because here we have uh, the uh, weight group actually causing the the main routine to actually wait before uh, um, before moving on so that the, the other scan operations can actually complete and, and do their work. So this is, this is uh, already looking good. Now, when we invoke the program, this time with a, a much larger range for our scan, let's see how this program behaves. Oh, I'm going to stop it right there because I want you to pay attention to what's happening here. Is that in some in some of the the as usual the 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 operations we were getting before, the errors we were getting before, were this uh, connection refused, which indicated that the port was uh, um, um, closed or that we couldn't, uh, the, um, that for whatever reason our scan had failed. But these errors, these socket errors, these are different. These are uh, as a result of the operating system telling our program that, hey, you actually have too many files open. You have too many, the resources have allocated for you, the allowances are made for you as a process to run on, uh, you know, within this environment you are violating them. So our program has run into a, a, an unbounded concurrency kind of problem because we need to take into account the constraints that are affecting our program, right? It's not about the how fast our program is able to execute uh, uh, something. It's about also the constraints that uh, the program must operate uh, within. So far, you've seen how easily we can leverage go routines in our program but also how easily we can run afoul of system resources if we don't manage the number of GoRoutines responsibly. The next set of iterations on our port scanner is where we start to pick up some techniques to deal with our unbounded concurrency problem. Let's jump back in. In this version of the program, we're gonna leverage a pattern, a concurrency pattern in Go known as the worker pool. For this to work, we need a designated number of uh, workers to be active at any given time. This is um, because we don't want to um, allow a, uh, uh, an infinite number of coroutines to, do, to be doing work. We want to limit that by a certain number. The way I'm limiting the number of GoRoutines in my program here is by using the number of CPUs, logical CPUs that I have on my machine. Now there's a number of different uh, factors to consider to get this number right for you, depending on what it is that you're trying to achieve. But for our purposes here, this works just fine. One of the enhancements I've made to this program is actually trapping the uh, um, any uh, sig in or sig term um, that might be coming um, when um, I'm running the program. I still want to show the results of whatever I've managed to scan so far. I've tucked away the parsing of the ports to scan behind this utility function. Nothing special there. Where things really start to get interesting is on line 46, where I've created a buffered channel uh, size to the number of workers I'm going to have active at any given time. The results chain here is about collecting the results of the scans from each worker. The loop starting on line 49 is about launching each worker in its own go routine. So if we mouse over the worker signature here, you'll see that I'm sending in a, uh, the porch chain in the read only mode, meaning that a worker can only pull from this channel. The results chain is also passed in, but the worker can only send the results into this channel. Starting on line 53, what I'm doing is launching a separate go routine to actually feed the ports chain that's going to allow the workers to just pull uh, ports from the ports chain to actually do the work. If I didn't set this up in a separate go routine here, we'd get to the point where this operation of sending a port into this ports chain would block our main go routine here. We don't want to do that. Starting on line 59, that loop here is all about reading the number of expected results that need to come back from our results chain. As the workers get done with the scanning, they push their results in the results chain, and we're just collecting them here and appending them into this open port slice of integers. The rest of the program is all about cleaning up after ourselves and printing the results. Let's see how it works. 
Before showing the results of the work we've just done, let's quickly take a look at the problem that we're trying to solve. So recall that back in the uh, synchronized version, but unbounded version of our program, we ran into this problem where we quickly ran a foul of this particular system uh, constraint, basically telling us that we had too many file handles open. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. We're trying to restrain our go routines from running into this particular issue. Now let's go into this version of our program, where uh, again, we're passing the same wide range of ports to scan, but using the worker pool pattern to constrain the number of go routines active at any given time. Let's run this. So you see, now we haven't run into the same issue that we ran before because we're controlling the number of groups that are active at any given time. So we're making good use or responsible use of the system resources and the system has no need to end our program or or cause us to, to run into a failure situation. So I'm gonna hit the control C here and you see that the signal trapping improvement that we added to the program actually works and we're, we're able to capture the results. We did scan port 54 on 32 as we have in the past. Now, if we stopped right here, you'd be well equipped to handle a broad set of problems with Go's concurrency primitives and do so in a safe way. But there's still another pattern I wanna introduce you to for two reasons. One, it is well suited for situations where you want an all or none approach to launching your routines. And two, you're able to leverage the standard library's context package and its benefits to great effect. This pattern is called the semaphore. Let's see how it works. To make use of the semaphore, we'll need to import it from its location in the xsync package. We'll jump down to line 49, where we're actually making use and in, uh, initializing the semaphore with this new weighted function. Now the function documentation may seem a bit daunting at first. So here's an analogy. Think of the semaphore as a mechanism of controlling, say, how many people are inside of a restaurant um, at any given time. So say you, it's you and your nine friends who are waiting for a table that can seat 10 people, uh, but the restaurant is at capacity at 100 people. In order for you and your nine friends to go in and sit and eat, you need to wait for at least 10 other people to walk out of the restaurant. Then you and your nine friends can actually go in, sit down and have a meal. The semaphore is a mechanism of controlling at any given time how many go routines are in play. When we initialize it with new weighted, we are providing the maximum capacity. This is what we're setting here. This is an arbitrary value that I'm setting at 100,000 here. You sitting down and waiting to be able to go in to sit with your friends, that's waiting for an acquisition, right? So this acquire here that we have is basically saying that I need to have at least n number of spots right, to go in in order for this operation to not block. And not, in other words, you sitting in the waiting area, waiting to go in to be able to eat. This is you sitting and just waiting there until you're able to get the, the 10 slots that you're waiting for, okay? And this value here, we've just made it a, a variable, uh, make it 100, right? So again, these values are arbitrary, but they work in relation with each other. All right, this acquire call, remember, it is a blocking call. So when we start scanning ports, we're gonna launch about a thousand go routines, right? 100,000 divided by 100. The moment we've launched a thousand go routines, this acquire call is actually going to block until spots starts clearing up. So how do spots get cleared up? Well, when the go routines are done doing their work, they will call this release on the semaphore releasing the number, the, the weight that basically they acquired, right, in order to actually do their thing. So as a GoRoutines finish their work, they release a, a weight back into the pool, if you will, and now others can actually acquire for that size. On line 68, this is just a blocking mechanism to ensure that all of the scanning operations are done before we move on and actually print the results. Let's actually see how this all comes together. I'm gonna run this program again with uh, the, the wide range of ports that we wanna scan. I'm gonna run this and you can see our semaphore is actually allowing batches of scans to be performed at a time. In the final example of this program, we're gonna make better use of the context that we were using to acquire our semaphore earlier. 
before showing you that, I've changed the SAM max weight and SAM acquisition weight a little bit just to help make the point a bit clearer. The acquisition here, remember, it's acquiring based on this context value. What we've done here is actually created a separate context for each one of the ports that we're about to scan. And we're using the timeout value here to set the deadline for this particular context. In other words, if we cannot acquire right, our semaphore by the time this context actually cancels or by the time it times out, then we're just going to skip over this particular port that we want to scan. Now, again, this is a contrived example, but you can see how something like this might be useful. Say if you need to hit multiple backends and if you can't get a response back before a certain amount of time, you wanna just move on to the next server and whatnot, right? So you can see how this might be a useful, a useful technique. I have a utility function called sleepy, which is just gonna help me introduce a at most n second delay into each of the girl routines that we're launching to do this work. We're gonna run the program without overriding the tight default timeout of five seconds. Let's do that. We see that we're inching our way through the scans um, one at a time. I'm gonna cancel that. And I'm now going to override uh, the default timeout, meaning that if within one second, I cannot acquire the semaphore because the context has timed out, uh, as will be the case for the random sleep that we have in there, then uh, those uh, port scans will be skipped. And we should see one coming up. There we go. So we've already seen a, a, a couple of, of scans that have been skipped because we couldn't acquire the semaphore in time. We'll round out our exploration of concurrency management in Go with a set of common and useful patterns, starting with the pipeline. You might already be familiar with the notion of a pipeline from other languages. Simply put, it's a series of steps a piece of data goes through where transformations may be applied along each of those steps as that data is handed off from one to the other. In Go, each of those steps is handled by a Go routine while channels facilitate the handoff between them. The first step is responsible for generating the input channel. From there, we'll have steps to do the scanning, some filtering, and some storage for good measure. Let's see it in action. This iteration of the program will only make use of a couple of uh, flags. Basically, uh, we obtain our list of ports like we've seen before and an R file that we default to the scan.csv, which is uh, this, where the storage uh, step of our pipeline is actually going to leverage that. So we're not going to do too much with that. Um, again, ports to scan here. We've seen this before. We're just getting uh, a slice of integers representing our list of ports, and we have our destination for the storage step. Now, before jumping into or unpacking the uh, uh, pipeline invocation here, let's quickly take a look at the uh, custom type that we're going to be using throughout this pipeline. The scan up uh, struct basically captures the port uh, that we, we scanned, uh, whether it was open or not, uh, any errors that might have occurred uh, during the scan process, and uh, the duration of that scan operation. And uh, the other methods that methods attached to that uh, uh, custom type are simply helpers for, uh, for when we're writing out um, to, uh, to the destination file. Okay, um, So let's go back to the pipeline invocation. What we're seeing here is sort of a nested uh, um, sort of an invocation of, uh, of a functions, uh, starting let's, with the innermost function being the gen function, whose job it is to actually generate that initial um, read-only channel of scan operations. Um, basically, it takes in that uh, list of variadic argument, that list of uh, uh, ports, and uh, returns that read-only channel channel of scan operations. That result in turn serves as input for the scan um, step of the process, which takes in as, uh, as, an, as a, an argument, the uh, inbound uh, um, sort of a channel, read-only channel of scan operations and actually returns uh, a read-only channel of uh, scan operations as well. That result in turn serves as input for the filter function and so on and so on down the chain, um, passing in uh, basically the, the result of each one of those uh, um, functions being uh, ser serving as, uh, as input rather to the next uh, function invocation. So let's actually jump to the definition of the gen function as a, as a starting point. The gen function, uh, again, takes in that list of uh, integers and its job is to return that initial set of uh, read-only channel for scan operations. So this is what we're initializing here with our make um, make call, uh, making sure that we have enough uh, room in that uh, channel um, for uh, the uh, number of ports that we have incoming. And now we're going to invoke a separate go routine uh, whose job it is basically to feed this uh, um, feed uh, scan operations into this outbound channel. This outbound channel, again, must be returned. It's going to be returned right away, but 
but in a separate thread of execution, we're going to have a sort of this process here, this loop here that's going to range over all the ports that were given and actually drop those into that uh, that outbound channel. So we have to make sure that to close this channel, however, to indicate to the consumer of that channel that there is no more data coming. That's an important step. Okay, the scan operation again takes in that inbound, that incoming channel, read only channel of scan operations, and its job is to return the exact same uh, signature. Okay, this exact same uh, sort of a, a type for the return. So this will allow the next step in the process to actually receive as input this read only channel again following the same exact process here and uh, basically initializing our outbound channel and uh, performing our scan operation making sure to capture some of the details that we've uh, we've uh, outlined in the uh, custom type and then feeding that scan into the outbound channel Okay, and then again for the filter, we're basically saying, hey, anything that wasn't uh, um, open, um, we want to, uh, to want to exclude. So we're just filtering out the list here. Again, each of these uh, functions follows the exact same um, sort of base mechanism of receiving, uh, at least as part of their signature, receiving that inbound uh, in, um, channel of uh, read-only, um, rather the read-only channel of uh, scan operations, and returning that read-only channel uh, of scan operations as well, so that to facilitate the next step in the process. Process. So the now that we see how this uh, pipeline is sort of uh, is put together and is invoked, is actually um, invoke um, um, our pipeline or invoke our program to see how the pipeline works. So I'm going to do um, 5,500, and um, according to our uh, default here, that should be a scan CSV. Let's pop that open, and uh, indeed there it is. Uh, so here we are. Um, we have uh, our header file, uh, our header uh, um, row here, and then we have our um, our results. So again, 5432 is uh, the only port I have open in that range. Now let me go back to main and let me remove a step in the pipeline. So I'm going to not filter um, for only the uh, open ports. Let me invoke this program again. And now let's take a peek at the results that we have. See here, we have the complete list right, of the uh, scans that are performed. Um, notice anything peculiar about uh, the sequence of ports? Now that we've seen the pipeline in action, the keen observer will notice that we've reintroduced a sequential scanning process. So how then do we leverage our pipeline to have more than one guillotine doing the scanning at any given time? Enter the fan out, fan in pattern. Fanning out allows the channel we're producing at the generate step to have multiple consumers that can perform the port scanning operation independently of one another, thereby reintroducing our concurrent processing and enabling for parallelism. These guillotines need to be merged back into a single channel that can facilitate the other steps in the pipeline, however. The merge step is where that fan in operation takes place. Let's see it in action. This iteration of the program only needs the ports that we're uh, scanning and uh, generating our uh, input channel, just like we did before. And uh, this is a, this fan out here is sort of a, a manual way of actually in, invoking um, sort of a three separate uh, go routines or three separate scan operations, um, each one of them with their own go routines uh, to do the, the scan operation, right? So this is the fan out. This is where we actually assign the work to uh, different go routines. And uh, we actually bring it all back using this merge operation here. So this merge op operation, this merge function, uh, basically takes in an arbitrary number of a, a channel, a read only channels, uh, containing uh, the uh, scan operation values and, and merge that and return back only the the uh, a single read only channel for the scan operation. That way we can feed that into other steps of the pipeline that we have on below, such as the filtering and, and, and whatnot that you've seen before. So let's actually take a look at the definition for this merge function to see exactly how it's doing this work. So let's jump to the um, the, the the for loop here because we have to use this loop because we, we know we have a, a multiple channels that we need to listen on to consume value values from right to basically assemble and then put and push through our outbound channel here that uh, our consumers uh, downstream are expecting to to uh, to consume to consume from right so basically we have this uh, for loop here ranging over and consuming from each one of those um, channels within that list right and basically feeding uh, the uh, the uh, the output channel so in order to actually force this uh, function to uh, um, to sort of uh, wait 
for all of the consumption to be done on those scan channels, we're actually using a wake group. So this is why we have uh, this sort of wake group initialized here and actually capturing the number of channels that we actually want to consume from, right? Um, before we can actually close this channel. So remember, we need to close this outbound channel, right? For, to a signal to uh, consumers um, downstream that, hey, there, there, there is no more data coming, right? In order for actually, uh, and obviously when we initialize this value, we need to return as soon as possible. We're going to basically have uh, this, this wait call that usually uh, accompanies every uh, wait group, right? We're going to have that into a separate growth team so that we don't block uh, this function here, right? But this uh, basically, this, this whole, the sole purpose of uh, this anonymous function is uh, to actually uh, wait right here until we can actually uh, um, consume, until we've actually consumed all of the content coming from the uh, the scan uh, chain here and then basically clo closing out uh, this, uh, the, the outbound channel. Okay, so pretty straightforward. So let's pop open this, um, let's actually run this program to see what we're getting as a result. So here we are, we're emitting um, all of the, the scan operations, not just the open ones. So we didn't filter out the results. Um, just so we can actually see the um, that the, there there is no, there is no sequential scan anymore. So there there's, there, there, it almost looks like uh, there's they're in sequence, but they're not, right? So we see this uh, in 5483 here, and then followed by 5485. Uh, and if you scroll uh, up a little more, you're gonna see, uh, you know, um, 68, 69, 67, and then 70, right? So they're not exactly in sequence. That's because we have different grow routines um, doing their own thing and, and doing that, that skin operation. So the more grow routines you add into the mix, the wider the variance will be between uh, each uh, each of the, the the ports being 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 uh, scanned. So before before we introduce sort of the final sort of uh, um, iteration of this program, uh, let's talk about sort of uh, some of the changes that we want to make. So here we we think there's an opportunity here to sort of have a more elegant way of in invoking the you know n number of uh, of workers, if you will. So we're going to bring that concept back and perhaps have a um, an argument when we invoke the program that we can override that with. And the other thing too is that the the in in a pipeline in a real world pipeline uh, stages don't always receive all of their inbound values, right? Sometimes that's that's by design. You want that, right? So maybe the receiver, you know, only cares about a subset of values to, in order to keep moving forward in the pipeline. Um, other times, you know, a stage may actually exit early, right? Because whatever inbound value uh, which is read represents some sort of error, right? That happened some somewhere along the the, the you know, or at an earlier point uh, within the pipeline. Uh, in either one of those cases, right? We don't want to wait around for remaining values to come because you know then there's no more values to be that that are going to be right? So we need a mechanism of actually signaling to any stage of our pipeline that there's no more data coming, that you should return early. Because remember, our growth teams are not going to be, you know, it's just going to sit and, and, and just be there and, and, and just run. They're not going to be garbage collected. You know, we need a mechanism of actually indicating to them, that, hey, you should return early. You should exit now uh, and, and go away. So we're going to introduce that, uh, these things into the next stage of uh, this, uh, this program. So there we go. We've added the uh, uh, the number of workers um, uh, as a as a parameter that we want to sort of uh, be able to override when we invoke our program, so that we can have uh, um, multiple um, go routines sort of um, performing operations when we do our fan out. And uh, this uh, parameter is actually used in this uh, fan out uh, section right here, whereby I'm just uh, simply looping over uh, up to the the number of workers that I want to have and basically doing that scan operation. So this is a sort of a more elegant way rather than invoking one at a time um, like we were doing before. The uh, other problem that we wanted to solve is to have a signaling mechanism, right, for our um, the different stages of the pipeline. So this done channel here is actually going to be going to serve for that purpose. So every time uh, we invoke a stage of our pipeline, we need to pass in this done channel as a sort of a, that signaling mechanism. So the scan has been modified to have that. Um, you can see here the uh, gen uh, function has been modified to have that. The merge function has been modified to have that. So let's actually take a peek at the uh, scan function to see how we're actually leveraging this. So the body of the function has largely remained intact. But what we have added, however, is the select block here. So this select is going to allow us to basically have a default case where we're doing the same thing we were doing before, uh, basically, you know, assembling our scan operation, feeding that into, into our outbound channel. But it also has this uh, case here where if we can actually pull a value off of the done channel, that means we received a signal to stop operations. We want to return right out of this go routine so that this go routine can, can go away. Otherwise, this go routine is just going to hang around, uh, even if it is no longer needed as part of the, the, 
the, the pipeline. Okay, so that's the only major difference here. We've added the select to be able to actually listen in on uh, this uh, done channel so that we can stop uh, operation. So the other parts of the, of the pipeline basically follow the exact same pattern here. Right. So let's actually see this in action. So let's pull up our um, terminal here and uh, let's do a, a, a run of the program and see if we can find the only open port. There we go. So that's the only open port within that range. So what I'm going to do next is actually show you how the signaling mechanism kicks in. So I'm going to um, leverage this special filter function that I have here uh, in my go. If I go to the definition for uh, this function, you'll see that basically I want to capture right any one of those functions where I have uh, sort of the operating system telling my process that I have too many open files, right? So I'm capturing any one of those uh, um, errors when they show up. And uh, what I'm doing here inside of my main function is actually saying, hey, if I do encounter, if I was able to read even the very first one, if I was able to read anything from uh, this uh, this uh, um, channel, what I want to do is I'm going to print something out, right? And I'm going to send that signal. I'm going to send that signal to all the later stages in the pipeline uh, to basically say, hey, I'm, I'm, you should bail. You should, you, we're done here. Um, something has happened that we don't care to, to proceed anymore. We want to bail out. Okay. So let's actually see this in action. So the next invocation I'm going to have, I'm going to provide a very wide range like we were doing before and then providing a very large number of workers, thereby pretty much guaranteeing that I'm going to run a file of the operating system by having too many file handles open. So let me uh, actually run this and you should see, there you go. So <laughs> the moment I found the very first um, uh, error of that kind. I basically sent a signal and uh, I exited out of uh, uh, this uh, this loop and basically the program actually ended up there. All right. So if I had any other stages of the pipeline, basically the, they would just basically receive the signal and and know to basically to basically shut down. Okay. So there you have it. Okay. That was a lot of information in 20 minutes, especially if you knew the Gogan currency. I invite you to check out the repository where I've put all the examples we've just walked through. I'm also available on Twitter if you want to reach out. As you've seen, Go's concurrency capabilities are pretty powerful, but you must always factor in the resource constraints surrounding your solution and properly bound your Go routines. I truly hope you've enjoyed our time together. Thank you. And now, Welcome to the live stream, Johnny. It's great to have you. Thank you for the talk, even though that sounds a bit weird to say, given the recording. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, we have a whole lot of questions lined up for you. Are you ready to jump in? Let's do it. Cool. Um, first one is, um, I guess it was answered at the end of the video, but just for the record, are these code examples available somewhere? Yes, they certainly are. Um, the uh, hopefully we can sort of have a the, it's sort of flash by quickly, but uh, um, yeah, we can definitely paste the, the full link to uh, um, uh, somewhere that everybody can get access to, or at least if you have my uh, uh, um, Twitter handle, you can you know chat me up on Twitter and I'll and I'll link it directly to you. It's all good. Awesome, thank you very much. Cool. Okay, so then let's get to the meteor questions. Uh, as usual, I'm gonna go by number of votes. Um, Top one says currently, uh, you have used the number of CPU cores to limit the number of Go routines for an IO bound operation. Is that the best approach? If not, what would you recommend? So, with the the what I typically recommend is that anytime you're dealing with the uh, um, sort of concurrent workload, there is obviously you're going to take into account whether you're 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 doing a, a lot of. Uh, um, um, disk reads, maybe, maybe you have a lot of uh, memory, maybe it's network, you have to figure out where what, what your main constraint is going to be, right. So in my case, you know, the, given sort of the, the contrite examples that I put together for in order to be able to sort of uh, illustrate some of the challenges right, with concurrency, uh, there, there's no there's no uh, uh, single right answer for well, you should always do it this way when you do an IO, you should always do it this way when you're doing a, um, when you have to deal with a network or you, when you have to deal with memory, it's going to be there's always a sweet spot that you have to find, right? In, in, in the real world, every project I've ever worked on that basically has a um, sort of a very, a, a ton of a sort of a, a concurrency um, happening, there's always a sweet spot you have to find because at the end of the day, the, the even when you're running sort of locally, 
when you're developing, the, the, the concurrency that you get from, from your own machine, right, is going to be perhaps different from that, that you know, your, your, your service or your program happens to get wherever it is it's going to be deployed, right, and maybe by some sort of orchestration tool, uh, um, containerized or something, wherever it's going to run, virtual machine, whatever, whatever is going to run. So you kind of, kind of, you kind of have to take these constraints into account, um, especially, you know, if, if, if the workload is going to be something that relies solely on sort of the, 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 the hardware virtualized or, or otherwise that uh, you're relying on, or do you have the constraint, is the constraint external to your services running environment? Is it, Maybe you're interacting with some sort of a remote service and the constraint is there, right? Maybe if you send too many requests, they will throttle you, right? So your concurrency needs to sort of a, a account for those constraints. And that's really part sort of the, the key takeaway from, from, from this talk is that you have to understand the constraints that you're dealing with, right? In order to actually properly um, sort of a, a approach, right? The, how much concurrency and, and how you're gonna manage the concurrency that you put in your programs. Yeah, that makes sense. So now see the bullet. Say again. So no silver bullet then. Right, exactly, exactly. All right. Um, speaking of silver bullet, um, what are some obvious places where one can look for dormant concurrency problems in their code? Ooh, um, the well, some of the first things that you you take to heart um, when you're first learning a, a sort of uh, concurrency in Go routines. Um, in, in the world of Go is that you kind of have to find out, you kind of have to know, right? Um, sort of where your, if if and, and where your Go routines are shutting down, right? So you should never launch a Go routine that you don't know how it's gonna shut down, where, where it's gonna miss you, how it's gonna return, right? So, because Go routines are not garbage collected. So if they don't return, right, they just hang around. Right? And not many people know that, right? So they, they're not going to get garbage collected. So you kind of have to know, you have to be able to signal to them like, hey, you're done, right? Shut down, right? So the, the whole, and especially in the last uh, portion of the talk, that whole point around the, the signaling mechanism was exactly to sort of handle that situation where if something were to go wrong inside of a grow routine and it never returns, well, it's just going to sit around and, and actually just, just never get uh, garbage collected. So you kind of have to know how your grow routines are going to shut down whenever you start them. The uh, other thing to sort of uh, look for is uh, basically, do you, do you have any shared resources uh, between your Go routines and not even realize it, right? Um, you can easily find out, you know, if, if you have a test suite uh, um, that, that you can add a, a dash race uh, to to when to your Go test invocation, or even when you run your program, you can add the dash race to that. And, and the runtime actually tell you, hey, you have some, some uh, concurrent access to a shared resource. So sometimes the shared resource, right, I mentioned uh, earlier that it could be some remote service. So the, the runtime is not gonna be able to tell you, right, if you have a, you know, a, a problem with concurrent access to some remote resource, right? That might even be a problem, right? But on the on the end of the of the remote service, right, say it's a, some, some remote API that you have to interact with, if you were launching a bunch of Go routines to make HTTP requests to that endpoint, right? If if you don't know exactly what the, what the bounds, what the upper bounds are, are right, what, what your what your uh, rate limits are, right, for interacting with that remote resource, you're gonna run, you're gonna run a fall in, into issues. It's, actually, that was some of my earlier uh, um, experiences with uh, using a ton of Go routines and whatnot, um, because I was you know launching a bunch of Go routines, interacting with some remote service. Everything worked well in my in during my testing because I had created a mock right of that that remote endpoint right so everything worked great I mean I could throw all kinds of concurrency at it and it worked like a champ but the moment I, moment I put that into production it had to interact with a real live service then my program starts to fail I didn't know why right only looking at the logs I, I kept seeing those uh, HTTP status codes telling me that I was being throttled right and I'm like oh crap I have I'm basically hitting that thing too much right so a lot of times it might not be obvious where your problems are but you kind of have to think through your constraints whether they be local or remote and you have to kind of look for those shared resources and, and really kind of know okay well am I managing right am I bounding my concurrency around these things yeah um, I think that takes us nicely to uh, another question. When would you use sync.mutex instead of channels? So the it's channels are a synchronization mechanism or rather a, 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 a think of them as a communication mechanism, right? So you need to be able to sort of uh, communicate from one routine to, to another. So it could be between your main routine and another routine or it could be across routines themselves. Think of channels are a, as a communication mechanism. 
but the mutex really had its purpose is is, is, is what sort of single purpose you know in, in terms of it, it's creating a lock around a very specific thing, kind of a one-time deal kind of thing, right? So the while you can synchronize access to a, to a shared resource with your channels, the mutex really, that's just one job, right? Basically prevent anything else from actually, you know, reading or writing to this particular resource, right? And, and then don't, don't let go until this go routine is done. And then now you can let another one in. The channels are all about the communication and allowing sort of that messaging to go back and forth between, between, between groups. Uh, go routines. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, this next one from Attila, I think it's more about like Go in general. Um, it says, first of all, great presentation. Um, Thank you. What are the libraries or tools that you missed from other programming languages in Golang? Honestly, I've, I've made, um, and, and I know I'm biased in saying this, but I've never, I've never come across a problem in Go that I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I wish I had tool X from, you know, Java or tool X from, you know, um, Ruby or or any of the languages I've, I've worked with that basically I, I couldn't do it in Go, right? So the the thing I like to tell folks that are sort of evaluating Go or <clears throat> thinking about Go um, and, and trying to see whether they should take the plunge or not, right? And then they start learning it and then they're like, oh, it doesn't do this in my language or doesn't that, you know, like this other language I know. Like I usually tell folks like, look, leave that sort of baggage uh, um, at, at the door when you enter the sort of the world of Go because it's gonna force you to sort of change your your, your thinking a little bit, uh, right? So like one of the first things, you know, I, I realized about Go is like, well, is it object oriented? I, <sighs> I guess if you squint, uh, is it functional? I mean, you have first class, you know, um, functions and you, you can do, you know, like function like things, right? We even have talks on, on functional go and things like that. Or um, what are the tools that I can use? What are the performance tools that I can use? You know, what can I, what, you, so you start to look for the same kind of tools you're familiar with from other, from other uh, um, sort of languages and, you know, in the world of Go, right? Go has a, a, a PPROF, right? You, you can do your performance sort of evaluation, uh, right? Using, using the, the, the Go tools, right? Um, we have a, a Delve as a, as, a, as a super powerful debugger, you know, that knows exactly how Go works and you don't have to use, you know, um, DDB or something like that, right? So you have, you have to sort of, uh, um, appreciate the tools and sort of the idioms of the Go world um, before you start to look for, 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 for places where it's sort of quote unquote missing something, right? That you might be familiar with from another language. So again, kind of a general answer, but you know, I think it's one, so if you take too hard, you'll, you'll find yourself sort of a less, you know, sort of in need of, of, you know, things that you're familiar with, right? You're gonna start to pick up new things that are more tune and more, more sort of a, a, um, appropriate right for the Go language itself. Hopefully that that's a, answers the question. Yeah, I, to me it does. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it does to uh, Attila as well. Um, and with that, actually, we are at the end of our time. So thank you very much for coming on for and answering these questions.